Good evening to the Columbus community. Today is the beginning of our new parent meeting series. The purpose of this parent meeting is to inform parents about the important issues related to educating their children. The Columbus Municipal School District recognizes that parents are their child's first teacher and their strongest advocate. We will continue to provide meaningful parental engagement activities and resources to raise an awareness and establish expectations about the learning environment. It is an important value for the district to provide information to parents as we work collectively as a community to prepare our students for college, the workforce, or a listing. We thank you for attending virtually and here at the auditorium. Welcome. Um, my name is Sheree Labat, Superintendent of the Columbus Municipal School District. And I will begin this evening by introducing our guest, District Attorney, Mr. Scott Colon. Scott is a native of Columbus, Mississippi. He received a Bachelor of Arts in English and a History from Millsaps College. After college, Scott was selected to teach in Guyana, South America by World Teach, a nonprofit, non-governmental organization based at the Center for International Development at Harvard University. World Teach provides opportunities for individuals to contribute working in developing countries. While participating in the program, Scott taught English in a small rural town in Guyana. Scott is also a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Law School, where he graduated from law. While in law school, Scott interned with a, the chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal in Rwanda, Arusha, Tanzania, and was one of the 25 students nationwide awarded a summer honors internship with the United States Department of Justice. He was also a member of the school mock trial and moot court team. After law school, Scott was one of 28 young legal professionals nationwide to be awarded the prestigious Gaten Fellowship to work with the Mississippi Center for Justice. During the fellowship, Scott worked with a group of nonprofits and organizations to combat the growth of predatory lending in Mississippi and to help develop affordable asset building alternatives. In 2011, Scott Cologne was appointed the youngest and first African American Justice Court judge in Lowndes County history. In 2012, he was appointed the Municipal Court Judge in Aberdeen, Mississippi. And in 2013, was appointed the first African American prosecutor for the city of Columbus. In 2015, he was elected district attorney for the Circuit Court District 16, which includes Lowndes, Atibaha, Clay, and Knox to be counties. He is the first African American district attorney to represent a majority white district in Mississippi history. Welcome, Mr. Colon. Thank you so much. Honored to be here. And our student guest is Mr. Gregory Harper. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Gregory. As you said, my name is Gregory Harper. I'm a senior at Columbus High School. Um, after school, I plan on going to Jackson State and majoring in political science. But I also plan on being a member of the Sonic Boom as I play a player as a second. After, after I made the group of science, I plan on going to law school at Howard University. Awesome and great undergraduate selection. Um, let's start with Mr. Cologne. What does a parent need to know about law and their children or their child? So that's a, that's a great question because uh, a lot of times parents don't know the rights that their, students, their children retain at school because the school is still a, it's a government agency, so it has limitations to how it can treat citizens based on our Constitution. Uh, there's a lot I can talk about uh, when it comes to that, but I want to focus on one thing in particular, and that's due process, right? So whenever the state uh, disciplines anybody in the criminal justice system or in the, the school system, there's due process rights that students have. They're entitled to a hearing. They're entitled to a parent there or a lawyer if they can afford one represent their, their views on, on what happened. They're allowed, they're allowed to uh, question the allegations against the child. They're allowed to do research into 
uh, an appropriate discipline for the allegations, uh, considering the past pattern towards how other kids were, were treated in those situations. Uh, also, one of the things that I always tell parents back when I was in college, I would tell the parents, uh, read the, 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 the policies and procedures of the school district. There's a lot of information in there, uh, and the lawyers for the school district will make sure those policies are legal. And so those, that, that'll tell you a lot of the rights that you have as a parent and as a student. So uh, when it comes to due process, I would, I would focus in on the policies and procedures that are uh, put in the, in the school's uh, policy. I, I think that's an important point because we start to talk about behavior um, and some other issues today. Um, an important topic we wanted to bring up is restorative justice, and that goes right in line with restorative justice. Tell us a little bit and, and educate our parents and community about what is restorative justice. Um, and um, after that, I'd like to give Gregory's opinion about what restorative justice is. Yeah, and so it's a, it's a new approach that's growing in popularity across the country. It's being used in the criminal justice system, but it's also actually being used in school districts a lot more. What we have learned is that there's a lot of research that shows that when it comes to discipline, disciplining someone for poor decisions, that one of the key elements is accountability, right? Accountability to the, to the harm, accountability to the bad decisions, but in a way that uh, forces the, uh, the person to have a reckoning for what they did. And we look at our criminal justice system, there's a lot of research that shows that in actuality, Although someone, because punishment and accountability are two different things. Someone could be punished for something and still not actually feel like they have been accountable for it. And thus the behavior continues. Exactly. So, for example, I always tell people, if you went to a, a prison in Mississippi today, and you asked 10 people why they were in prison, probably eight of them are going to say, I had a bad lawyer, the judge didn't like me, somebody lied on me. Very rarely do people say, that I harm somebody else. Which is one of the key steps to rehabilitation is actually acknowledging harm. Uh, and so I think that restorative justice is a powerful tool that we need to probably really start with implementing in the school district. And let me explain what it is. So let's say uh, there, I'll give myself an example because I want people to know people can make bad decisions. When I was in middle school, I got into a fight at a football game. Uh, with somebody that I actually thought was bullying me. And then I had some peer pressure at the football game to stand up for myself, so I ended up punching the guy first, the student first, and the police briefly arrested us and detained us, and then they released us. And so I went to school on that Monday, and I got suspended for three days, right? I never talked to this student I got in a fight with. The principal never heard out any reason of what led to the fight, and you know, luckily, my parents disciplined me enough outside of the school where I didn't repeat that behavior. But I don't think that the person I got in the fight with had that same type of accountability in history. So what restorative justice would do, instead of just suspending the kids and pretending like we're just going to, that's going to make everything better, <laughs> what it did is it said, okay, what it does is say, let's have a facilitator sit these two children down and let's actually talk about what led to it. What uh, what is the harm that he was causing me by bullying me? What is the harm I caused him by throwing the first punch at a football game? You know, what was going on in his life that caused him to feel like he was bullying me? What were my peers saying to me that made me feel like throwing the first punch was an appropriate response to that thing? And so, uh, and then you have a facilitator that, that kind of is mature enough to make sure that the conversation uh, go in the right direction. And a lot of times, what you do is you have some other students or people, a part of it, that are, that can also be supportive of the idea that we need to be uh, forgiving to each other, but also acknowledging the harm that we cause. And there's a, this is, this is a, 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 an approach that's growing in popularity, and so far the research has been promising. Because acknowledging that harm, getting to the root cause of the cause of behavior is actually much more effective than just sending, you know, a kid home to school for, away from school for three days. And you may have to do that if the restorative justice circle doesn't work or, you know, of course, you, you got to have safety, 
for the for the Phoenix school. But for the most part, we've got to try to fix it when they're younger because you know, once it gets the higher, the older they get, the the, the, the more you know discipline they receive from school, then it goes then it goes into the prison system, and then it gets harder and harder to fix it. And so the more we can try to get to actually figure out what is going on with, with children and their decision making, the, the actually the safer Columbus is going to be. You know what I think is interesting about that, that is that, you know, as I grew up, uh, my parents had their own restorative justice, but, you know, even the responsibility to your parents and family for your decisions, like you said your parents thank you, but it kind of made you accountable to them um, and the things that they would have to deal with with your discipline action, which is a, a sense of accountability, right? And then the accountability of you fighting and that impact on the community. And so when you understand that, you start to think differently. Where do you really get off? I think that what you were saying about how his parents were probably the way to it's all accountability. It's all accountability. It really leads to the fact that we really need support for you. Um, his parents are support because school can really support him when he's in the community. Those in the town. And some people, you know, don't have a great home life. So they need to get that course from school. So our school should be allowed by students, they should, they should be supplied by students to support them. I, I agree with you. You know, um, in, in, as we develop more support systems within the school district, it's important for us to uh, establish those relationships, get to the cause and root of the behavior, have the conversation, understand the why behind the behavior. Uh, you know, we, we have different systems in place that we have discussions with, with, with our students, but really getting behind the behavior is an important part of a preventive measure and, like you said, accountability. What are some initial steps outside of counseling do you think we can do as, as a school district and something we can tell parents as far as what we can do as a district to support the sort of justice process? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, we do it in the district attorney's office. I have somebody that's trained in restorative justice, and we have people that have been harmed, sit down with people that have did the harm, and come to uh, sort of try to reconcile through that process. And I've done it for, for situations that you would be shocked. I had a situation where a, uh, a, a, a young man was murdered. I mean, it doesn't get more serious than that. There's, there's no greater harm than taking somebody's child away from them. Throughout, through the process of trying to figure out what punishment the person that killed her son wanted, the mother wanted to know what happened. She wanted to know specific details of what led up to the murder. Uh, more so, she cared more about that than really about what punishment the person received. Because she wanted to know how her son was taken from her and that mattered more to her because she, I think she had come to the point where she realized that someone came back regardless of what happened to this person. And so the person, you know, we did the restorative justice circle. She was very thankful for it. She made a point of saying, I forgive this person that, that took my son's life. And he was still said it. He still got, you know, uh, he still went to prison as a result of it. But uh, her view on it did impact his sentence. And I say that as an extreme example to make the point that A lot of times when we, when we talk about behavior, we want it to be black and white. When in reality, a lot of times, decision-making behavior is gray. And so, um, what I would say is, I really would encourage the public municipal school district to do the research about how the social justice is being done across the country and be the first school district to do it in Mississippi. Because it's not very expensive. It's, you know, and you can start, you can do a pilot program where you, you, see, you see how it works. For it to be successful, it has to be voluntary. Both people have to voluntarily want to do it. But what I would say is, and I would say this to the parents, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of the same. So it, last time I looked at the disciplinary policies and procedures of the school district, they were very similar to the way they were when I was in school. You know, uh, I was looking at some of the research, and uh, one of the first steps in restorative justice is creating a community 
that's anchored in shared values within the school system. And I know our uh, high school principal, uh, Kirk Chapman, is just, uh, you know, when you're 10, she's 15. You want a good name, Mr. Hamlin? I mean, Mr. Tarver, uh, just talk about what what uh, shared value in a high school, when that starts to happen, how does that make things different when you feel like you're a part of a team, something shared? It makes you feel like you're part of a community. It makes you feel like you are, <clears throat> like your actions affect on society itself. Like your actions don't just reflect upon you, it reflects on, it reflects upon not only our whole school, but our whole community, the whole district. So can you give some examples, you know, good or bad or indifferent of things that you've seen that are related to restorative justice in the school district? When it comes to home people accountable, I know that for one instance, if you're in any association like if you're in the band or choir, if you have a disciplinary action, you can't perform it to that how that tough along you are district. Um, so in the band if you get into a fight, how long you're suspended you don't get the point, if there's a performance, you don't even get to participate in that. Um, that's our band director, and they talk to you about it. They don't just, you know, take you out of performance, they can make you talk to them about it, explain to them what you do and why you do it, even though they still do the same thing. And I think that sense of accountability is more reflective in nature. Why would I behave this way? What's going on? Gregory, Gregory talked a little bit about our students um, having different home lives and different types of support system. Uh, you know, as we talk about uh, accountability, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a fine line, but I think the reflection part makes you understand the why and build your relationship and then uh, as you move forward. Is there any other examples or things that you think we could do better or differently? I feel like that's the question. Yes. Uh, so. You've been, you went to the Columbus Municipal School District, right? Yes, sir. I mean, how many fights do you think you've been? Far too many. Probably at least 10. Okay. What happened as a result of fights? They, in high school, they were using handcuffs and sent sometimes to jail. Did that stop people from fighting? Never. So it didn't work. <laughs> and a lot of times it's the same people who get into the fights. I never, it's usually not different people, it's the same people. Yeah. And that's been my experience. 20 years ago, right? So I think that that's sort of what Dr. Levine is asking you, which I think is very key, which is we're doing the same thing over and over again. Maybe we should try something different <laughs> and see what happens. Uh, because, I mean, did you feel safe at school? Usually, sometimes, no. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, there was one time I remember I was reading band and I, in the hallway, Everyone's eyes were being irritated. We realized because there was so much pepper spray in the hallway from the fight that was, that everyone's eyes, and it was hard to breathe at one point when we got to where it actually happened. That when I was like, what happened that I have to feel this irritated by someone else's actions, you know? But um, and that, and that's your, I'm, I'm hoping that thing over. No, I'm not you. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever accused you of not talking too much. <laughs> but I guess what, what I hear from that is, that's a common problem we have across our country, which is we don't do a good job doing it. We don't teach conflict resolution. It's hard. It, it, is, it is difficult. It is very difficult. And a lot of times we learn conflict resolution from our parents. But not everybody's parents have been given the tools themselves to learn, to know how to pass on conflict resolution. And so that's something else that restorative justice really is trying to teach people is how to resolve conflict in a way that avoids violence. Because violence is never a way to resolve. It almost only makes conflict worse. Uh, so I just want to add. Well, I just want to relate to student achievement. So when you have higher expectations of your children to behave well, they also perform well academically. So it all goes back to what you're talking about with the relationship of conflict resolution. It's about the relationship that we have with children and our relationships with our students. We really, really want to continue to bring non-parental mentoring support within the school district so that those relationships are established, especially for those students that may not have that support at home. Um, the second was make participation in the community a requirement. So that's almost to the fact that if you go to Columbus High School, you are a part of Team 215, these are the rules. What do you think about that, Gregory? 
making participation in the school community like the high school are a requirement so as you if, if you come to columbus high school you are part of this team so part of this team like number one these are our shared values what do you think about that i agree i believe that you know i'm a member of the baby club we do a lot of service projects in the community we do food drives things like that after the storm, we did cleanup after, you know, after, you know, that was two years ago we had that major tornado that ended up destroying huh? mm -hmm. we helped, we helped do cleanup after and stuff like that. I believe that getting involved in ways like that will really help. It allows them to feel like, like I said earlier, it makes them feel like they're a part of something, and that's really important to a lot of people. Like I said, a lot of people don't have that family life. They feel like they're alone. They feel like their community also is supporting them. That's another major problem. Tell me a little bit about that, the community supporting you as a high school, as a child, as a, 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 a young man headed to Jackson State University in August to be a part of the South Boom. This is Jackson State. Correct. Um, tell me what do you, you feel about community support and expectations? I can give you an example of how it's expected. I have friends who work at restaurants or whatever, and when they serve, they their service, they always ask them, what school do you go to? And you know what they tell them? Columbus High. And they're like, really? You don't seem like you go to Columbus High. And I believe you all understand what those expectations are. They believe that if you go to Columbus High, you're un, you know, poorly spoken, or unintelligent. That's what they believe. That's what a lot of people in our community believe. And it's saddening because we feel like our own, our own community isn't supporting us in the way they should. You know, that's unfortunate. Um, and as a superintendent, um, we're working very diligently to just really stop those type of low expectations of our students. I felt for myself as a superintendent, it's been an ugly battle. And I believe in high expectations. I believe all of our students can achieve it at high levels. And I tell you just before we start, we don't have a student problem, we have an adult problem. We're going to work to, to uh, mend those uh, situations. We're going to start by giving our parents the advocacy and information that they need and for them to you know, demand excellence from our school district and our employees so that we can achieve at high levels. This is what this conversation is about. We want to empower parents to demand achievement, support, and resources so that we can start the process, continue the process of achieving at high levels. You deserve great facilities, you deserve, you deserve great resources, and you deserve conflict resolution if you decide to do anything before graduation other than achieve at high levels before that. Correct? Correct. Sure. Um, the idea of great facilities leads me to another thing. One thing I've noticed, every day you go to the side, you see, it makes it, it starts off a day bag, and that parking lot is horrible, and everyone notices that. I remember just, you know, getting dropped off. Every time I notice that, there's so many potholes and things, and it makes you, it starts off, you think that your community already, your community, your school district already in support you. That's how you start off the day. Well, we're going to work to remedy that too. This is a real good conversation because it's good to get a student's perspective of things that we're working on and continue to uh, provide excellence to our community. Um, third is modeling teacher community values. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. They said, uh, you know, exposing our students and, and, and making sure that they that we have models of people around, like mentors, that they are getting that receiving that support. Can you and Mr. Colon talk about that? Well, I mean, so I'm actually disappointed, uh, uh, Gregory, that I'm just now meeting you, right? Because you, 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 you're very articulate. I mean, I love that you're going to Jackson State. I'm kind of iffy about you going to be a lawyer. We talked about that. You got to be careful about going to law school. It's a, it's a tough profession. But the reasons you want to go to law school, I think, are, are the right reasons, you know, to make a difference in your community. And that's what we need lawyers that want to make a difference. Because I've tried to mentor people that wanted to be lawyers in some municipal school district. I've got quite a few uh, that have done very well. I can tell you, uh, one of them. And we also, thinking about the stereotypes about Columbus High or some municipal school districts, sometimes we don't champion our success stories well enough. We got some great success stories from, I mean, from rock stars out here. I mean, I, I know one, a guy named Rashad Z. He, uh, I've met him probably seven, eight years ago. He was a junior in high school, uh, was interested in, uh, in law. I talked him out of it. <laughs> he ended up getting a, uh, a, now he's at, went to Syracuse, 
got to go to doctor there, and now he's at Tufts in a PhD in English. An African American male in a PhD in English, four cops from Tufts. From Columbus, District, Columbus, Mississippi, Columbus Municipal School District. And we don't, not enough people in the community hear those stories. And that's what we got to do because we got, the people typically, they, they, if you have low expectations for somebody, typically they're going to meet your low expectations, right? Some people are able to go beyond expectations for various reasons, but a lot of people, especially younger people, they're going to, they're going to meet the expectations that are there for them. And so what we need to do is expose people like yourself that have so much potential, and all, all the students in our school district, expose them to role models that give them the expectations of what they can achieve, because the sky's the limit. God is the limit, you know, and you're going to achieve great things, and when you come back and you're a lawyer, you just make sure that you reach back to the school district, and you mentor somebody, and you make sure that they know they can, they can do it, you know, there's nothing that can stop them. And let's talk about some positive things. What have been some positive experiences that you felt from your youth in, within this uh, Columbus Municipal School District? Um, as I've already mentioned, I'm the choir and baby club. Like those groups, my first love. Well, I was a, it's always been politics and music. So I've always felt like being around people. My band for instance, Mr. James. I have known that man for seven years. Now. He's been my teacher for seven years. So now he's become almost like a father to me because I've known him for so long. So I feel it's allowed me to build that relationship. Without groups like band, without groups like choir, you wouldn't be able to build that relationship with the teacher. Basically, any in our school district. Um, so I always love that. And uh, the things that the opportunities that you have given us with the choir have also been great. Um, so, part of restorative justice is that consequences should be educational. Um, I had, I'm raised by Southern, so all of my consequences were always educational. You know, our parents took the time to say, you know, punishment kind of fits crime with accountability. So uh, let's think about it. What are some ways you think that 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 we can create accountability that are educational? In there? Um, you know, I'm a big proponent, and we started doing this in previous school districts of community service. You know, and serving something that may have been consequential to a reaction or an action of the behavior. Do you think that's a, a good example or some something that's educational? Yeah, I do think that's a good example, and. and, and I'm really excited about the points you're making about the sort of justice, the principle behind it, because I think that's really highlighting why it's a, a, a really great approach to, to uh, uh, harm reduction and conflict resolution. Because one of the things that I've seen when I've, I've, I've observed uh, sort of justice work is one of the ways you get someone to understand how they harm somebody else is to get them to recall when they been harmed themselves, right? So if somebody's a bully, typically they've been bullied, right? That's insecurity, usually. So, you know, get them to somehow realize how they felt when they were bullied. And, you know, that's educational because that discipline is educational to them, right? They're learning, okay, this is why I can't do this because I know how I would feel or I have felt when this was done to me. And the same thing with community service, right? I mean, that's an opportunity to get someone to understand that not only is there accountability, but there's service to the accountability, right? There's giving back, there's making our community better, there's being a positive influence. Uh, like our, our future marriage, I think I think I think I can see a future marriage in the room here. What we talked about community service, since we talked about some of the service projects we did after Hunt was destroyed in 2019. I feel like that would be a great idea, um, allowing the students, as a first technologist, to be able to feel accountable, but also to actually help our community in a way would be great. Awesome. So uh, let's, let's talk to Gregory for a moment. Uh, why do you feel support systems are important? I feel that, as we've already said, our community is not pushing us as far as it should be. So you have to have something to hold on to, to tell be able to tell you, you can do this, you can achieve whatever you want to, you can be whatever you want to be. 
the fourth one, so that's what I believe. That's what my story is. I don't, I certainly didn't believe it because I have a great family, a great mother, but you can see the option. But um, I, having a support group, she, she just needs someone to push you to be the great that you So how do you think uh, support systems, uh, Ms. Ridgewall, uh, works in line with restorative justice? Yeah, I think they go hand in hand. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, education is a great equalizer in society. That's one of the things that I mean, people don't recall this, but public education, the idea that taxpayers come together to provide every, uh, education for everyone, is a very American idea. We were really the leaders in that. And the rest of the country has, has followed along that, that leadership. And, you know, so it just, I just feel like it's, it's, it's very important. I'm almost got the question. <laughs> Support systems align with, yeah. with, with the source of justice. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, I, I think like in this process of reflection, you know, as you tell a, a, a child about accountability, right. let's say for a middle school fight, how do you bring a parent in to talk about what you can do at home, uh, right. reflect upon what they they've done, you know, even bring out things related to faith and other other um, um, accountability issues as it, it, it relates to being reflective. Yeah, I mean, and the thing about because what I'm hearing is we got to have support systems for the students, but we also got to have support systems for the parents. Because you know there's a bunch of research out there about underachieving students and what it takes to get them to succeed, and it's a it's, it's a it's a complicated thing. It's very difficult. It requires a lot of people moving in the same direction. But the great news is. All the research back is up. Every parent wants their children, their child to succeed. Amen. Parents out there, once your kids to be seen, let's give you a round of applause to our parents. So, so when people say, oh, well, they don't have the best parents, or if we got to get to the parents, the great news is if you get to that parent, that parent wants their child to succeed, no matter the circumstances. They want their child to succeed. And you know, that's why we're here. We want to tell them to kick and scream until we continue to provide everything that they need to be successful. It's so important. Um, and you know, and for and I'm so glad that you advocated for our students that may not have that parental support. You know, um, any educator, teacher, teacher assistant, food service worker, janitor, we have to be people's parents. So all of my educators out there, I see Ms. Rainey, I see several of our educators here, Dr. Vito, we have to be somebody's mother or father in this business or we're not doing the work. And so it's so important, very, very important. Uh, so, you know, as we continue to ask for volunteers to be non-parental support and mentors, if that's something that you're interested in doing, please call our central office. We want you in the building. We want you reading to our children. We want you advocating for our children. And most of all, having high expectations of our children. You know, I thought one of the things you said was compelling. It's telling our stories so that our students will and our community will continue to have high expectations of our children. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're about creating the narrative, then understanding that we have the next mayor of Columbus, Mississippi. Can I get a round of applause? Sitting right here. Um, I mean, somebody that wants to have a legal background, and for him to have a mentor that is a graduate from this great district right next to him. And, and the interesting thing is, um, I, I'm not a believer in consequence, but in the faith of God, this happened <laughs> the way it should have, is that they didn't know each other before they got here. Interesting enough, he wants to be a lawyer, an attorney, and go in politics, and then here we are with, with Scott Cologne, and they've known each other through email this long, um, in the last week or so, but really didn't know each other until they came here today. So this is really sick. You, get, you have to get his email address, so. He's going to Oh, awesome! Will you look at that? Let's give a round of applause. That's awesome. Making these connections. Um, gosh, I would say something, but you know, I can't let the bat this bat will come out of me, so hallelujah. So, uh, suspension rates, um, I did talk earlier that the state uh, wide suspension rate of 16% in our district is 43%. We have put in positive behavior um, programs throughout our district to be more positive in the way we approach our students. So, we are doing things systematically to work on relationships, um, peer uh, interventions, 
and really focusing on building those positive relationships. Uh, and working with our principals recently, they talked about the biggest, the, the, the most influential, and I don't want to get statistics and have the effect size, but it's the biggest influence a teacher can have on a child, and I'm going to put this out to community and parents, is to have high expectations of them. So when we all feel and believe and know, not think, but know, our students can and will and do behave well, right? And achieve at high levels. As we say, so it shall be, correct? And so a part of this is just giving our parents the tools that they need to, to be advocates for their children. Um, uh, Mr. Colon, outside of due process, is there anything else you'd like to detail for our parents about what they should know about the law? I, I kind of want to just talk about preventative processes to the juvenile justice, um, getting in the juvenile justice system. And we just have to be really open about these conversations. You know, it's very important for us to have high expectations, but our kids are not perfect. They make mistakes, correct? And so what can we do, at, you know, I know from the school standpoint, we really work on early living, so we know that a rigorous, great curriculum and school system continues to produce great citizens, and we're going to continue to work, and it's hard work. Thank you for acknowledging that and doing that. And, and getting our parents to understand what they need to demand for literacy, what they need to demand from teachers as far as excellence and achievement and resources. We're going to continue to have those conversations. But if we don't have a perfect child, you know what I mean, and they do make mistakes, what are some things that we can tell a parent from a preventative measure and or a child that may have made a mistake, you know, or you're dealing with them doing things that they shouldn't do? Should because we all know that we are all kids and we're perfect, correct? Please laugh. I can tell you, I made a ton of mistakes myself. I mean, I had, I, mean, I, was, I was born and raised on third base, so, you know, and I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but, um, so, one thing is, 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 as a parent, make sure your kids know their rights, right? The United States Constitution gives each American citizen amazing constitutional rights. And the key to them is just to know, know how to exercise them, right? If you are, um, you know, being questioned, um, you know, you have the right to remain silent. That's a constitutional right that you have. Make sure your kids understand that. You have a, a right to record interactions with the police if you feel like you're being, you know, harmed in some way. You have a right to file complaints against, to address grievances against the government, right? You have that right. And what I always tell people is you'll be surprised the impact you can have if you exercise your constitutional rights because a lot, of, for example, with me as district attorney, if you call me, I'm gonna call you back. It might take you a few days. If you email me, I'm gonna email you back. You can get my attention and the parents who take that effort and, and, and are, are persistent about telling me about their child, telling me what's going on with their child, helping me figure out what's the appropriate response for whatever they've been accused of doing, those parents typically get better results than the parents that don't do that. You know, it's just, just being realistic, you know, because I, we as district attorneys, the district attorney's office, we have too many cases to do that work ourselves. So be an advocate for your child. The system really responds to advocacy because if you're an advocate, you'll get results a lot more than you probably think you will. You know, that's interesting. That's why we're here. <laughs> advocate for your child as it relates to achievement. Advocate for your child as it relates to justice and being a citizen of this great country and this great state and this great city of Columbus. You thinking about the law field and just listening to Mr. Colon, I know you're inspired. I can see all the, the, the brain cells just kicking off in your head. So what have you said that's inspired you about knowing your constitutional rights and your parents knowing your constitutional rights? And how would that make you, uh, I would say, dive into being a, a political science major at Jackson State this August? I feel like knowing your rights is a fundamental part of being a American citizen. Like, our Constitution is what makes us who we are as a nation, right? So, understanding that our legal process, as you were saying, we have to make sure everyone knows what their rights are. And the school, we have a plan, they have a plan from the U.S. government that tells you, but it doesn't really focus on it. But 
it makes you really want to further delve into making people, making sure people know what what their rights are, what they should and shouldn't have to do. And I think that's a great, great point for parents. Um, anything else about law, you say? I think knowing your rights is just fundamental. And you know, the same thing with school districts, knowing what is expected for grade level for English and math, knowing what your child can learn about early literacy, knowing what safeguards and safety nets you should provide as a school district, you know, wanting things to uh, continue to be get better in our school districts. Those are things that and the word is advocacy, yeah. which is the reason why we do it. We want parents to advocate for their children because you get what? Results. Absolutely. Sir, I want to uh, start with a poem that someone in my uh, prayer group sent me that was interesting. And um, I, 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 I read it to your, your wife. This is a surprise. I read it to your wife. And I want you to tell me why it's significant. Um, it's, uh, I'll start. Okay. It's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives for volition, veil of tears, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do these deeds? Who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best in the end of triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails by daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know the victory nor the feet. Theodore Roosevelt. So why is that significant to you? So look, I text this to her, okay? And you tell me what her response was. That's his favorite quote. That's his favorite quote, and it's... it's oh, I've got that in my office. And it's in his office. And so I thought that was significant. Um, and you know, I, I know I read this, uh, this, the quote is rather fast, but what did you tell this gentleman about starting law school about this quote in Theodore Roosevelt and what it means to you? It, it changed me. I, you know, I've heard a lot of quotes, but this one, someone sent this to me and put it in an email for me. It, 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 was, it changed me. I, I think I read it at least once a week. Tell Gregory. I, I love that quote, and, and, I, and, and Gregory, I'll email it to you uh, because it's really one that I want you to uh, think about because the credit belongs to the person that's in the room. Right? The easiest thing to do sit on the sidelines and criticize. <laughs> the easiest thing to do in the world. But if you get in the arena and you try to make any change, it's very difficult. It's going to come with criticism. It's going to keep you up at night. It's going to cause anxiety. But you, you will not get it. You will not reach your potential unless you're in the arena. And it, you know, the best example I always tell young people is, right now we all think about Martin Luther King Jr. as he's a saint, he's an American saint. He's extremely popular. He got national holiday. When he died, he was very unpopular. Throughout most of his life, he was not popular in America. Yeah. So don't always do the popular thing if you don't think it's the right thing. And sometimes the population, they know what they're talking about. You need to take their, their you know, you need to listen to them. But sometimes you gotta stand up for what you think is right and uh, follow your principles and it worked out for Theodore Roosevelt, he's perfect. Great, and what do you think about the quote, Gregory? I still, I have not exact, I always agree with the fact that he really shouldn't complain if you aren't willing to do the work. For, like I've always felt that very, voter suppression has been a big issue, so me and my friend Jacob came together with the seven in high school and we helped register, I believe it was over 100 high school seniors to vote back in either November or October. And we have, we all have to realize that if we want to change, if we want change, we have to be that change. We have to, we have to be the change we want to see in our community. I love that being a part of the solution. That's awesome and very positive. So uh, I have a couple questions for for you all before we end, and I'll start with Mr. Cologne. Uh Mr. Cologne. What are your hopes and dreams for the Columbus community? That's a, such a great question, but such a big question. You know, I, I would hope that we could be a shining example for um, 
what the South can be uh, for our country, uh, a place where it, that we are a healthy community, we're an educated community, we're a community that, that respects each other, uh, loves each other, forgives each other, and um, works together. And you know, those are difficult things to achieve. I mean, that sounds like utopia, and I, and I get it. But uh, if we're all striving for that, we can work with disagreements about how to get there. You know, it's like what you said with the shared values. It's too rare that school districts, cities, you know, offices, anybody focuses in on what are our values. Do we have getting with everybody that says let's focus on our shared values? Um, so if we can have shared values, you know, nothing we can't talk about. All right, okay. What are your hopes and dreams? My hopes and dreams are to leave this city, this community, this state, a much better place than what I found. I want to do whatever I can to create a community where people are able to reach their potential. Because there's so much talent going through the, the halls of the high school. There is ambitious. We, as, you, as you know, one of our, he was the senior when I was a freshman, Robert Wood was into the NBA. I was really about to. You know, into the NFL draft. It's, there's so much talent, physical, but also musical. There's so many singing musicians at our school that most people don't even realize. And I want to create a community where these people can actually reach their goals. Infrastructure where these people can connect with people that can push them in the position they want to be. I think that's all. We'll end on that note. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming. Um, in closing, uh, you know, your attendance means the world to us um, on behalf of the Columbus Municipal School District. We hope that you've learned something this evening that will assist you and your child in their education journey. We hope that you use this information to advocate for your child and to demand excellence and achievement from the Columbus Municipal School District. Your child deserves the best. Join us next month as we'll have a discussion about your child's literacy with Kristen Wynn, the State Literacy Director. Thank you again and have a